Hello and welcome back to Historical Context. Today we are continuing our journey through the Narvaez expedition and today is the second part of the series. If you want to know what happened in the last episode, part one, go back and uh, listen to that podcast and we'll pick up where we left off. We left off last time with the expedition approaching the Appalachian tribe and they were up in the panhandle of Florida. That's where the, the Appalachian tribe was, right around, right around the panhandle of Florida. And there were rumors that the Appalachian had gold. So Narvaez was following through to see if that was the case. They met a native chief who was an enemy of the Appalachian, and that native chief had some of his tribe accompanied Narvaez to the Appalachian site. So with the Appalachian now in front of them, Narvaez sends forward 50 men by foot and nine by a horse to head into the village. Let's have a look at what happens. Upon penetrating into the village, we found only women and boys. The men were not there at the time, but soon while we were walking about, they came and began to fight shooting arrows at us. They killed the inspector's horse, but finally fled and left us. So the Appalachian have an altercation and eventually leave. The group that's there takes a bunch of maize, which again uh, is to help keep them supplied and fed. The description goes on to read about how the land was full of tall trees with large lagoons, and these lagoons were very difficult to cross, and these men did cross them often because they were very deep. The animals in the area were described as deers, rabbits, bears, lions, and other wild beasts. So the reading continues in the same day as the battle occurs, and there's uh, a new development. Two hours after we arrived at Appalachian, the Indians that had fled came back peaceably begging us to give back to them their women and children, which we did. The governor, however, kept with him one of their chiefs, at which they became so angry as to attack us the following day. So another battle. They did it so swiftly and with so much audacity as to set fire to the lodges we occupied. But when we sallied forth, they fled to the lagoons nearby. So I think it's interesting here that, uh, you know, they come back pleading for the prisoners to be released, if you want to call them the prisoners. The governor, who's Narvaez, turns them over, but Narvaez keeps one of the chiefs, and that leads to yet another fight. The footnotes in the translation had an interesting quote, and I wanted to read that to you. To return the non-combatants to the Indians was not very wise. It shows that Narvaez and his officers had little knowledge of Indian culture. Of course, of course that would be the case. Nobody had knowledge of, of Indian culture at the time. It's obvious that Narvaez was in over his head. We, I think we already established that in the last episode. It is later noted that one Indian was killed in the altercation. The next day, after what was mentioned here, the Indians attack again, and they kill a member of the expedition. And Narvaez would stay in this area for 25 days. And throughout these 25 days, there would be sporadic attacks. And the chief who accompanied them, remember from our last episode, that chief who said, these are my enemies, that chief would end up being killed in one of the subsequent attacks. Now, the captured chief, who Narvaez kept with him, the captured Appalachian chief told Narvaez that there was a town to the south, it would be about a nine-day walk, called, we'll call it Aute, A-U-T-E, not 100% sure of the pronunciation, but we'll call it Aute. In that town, there was gold. So Narvaez decides to go to that town. And on the second day of their journey, they encounter a lagoon, once again, as I said earlier, very deep, 
and they had great difficulty crossing it. And here's what happened. The water reaching our chest, and there was a great many fallen trees. Once in the middle of it, a number of Indians assailed us from behind trees that concealed them from our sight, while others were on fallen trees, and they began to shower arrows upon us, so that many men and horses were wounded, and before we could get out of the lagoon, our guide was captured by them. So the governor ordered the horsemen to dismount and attack them on foot. The pursuer dismounted also, and our people attacked them. Again, they fled to a lagoon, and we succeeded in holding the trail. There were many men that day who swore they had seen two oak trees, each as thick as the calf of a leg, shot through and through by the arrows. So these arrows were very powerful, very powerful, and shot at high speed so as to actually uh, you know penetrate into an oak tree now just imagine putting yourself in this situation where you're crossing an unknown body of water you got water up to your chest and all of a sudden it just starts raining these arrows so it's not a surprise that a lot of men were wounded in this in this assault and you know Narvaez continues his travel towards Ate really I don't know if it was out of necessity that he reached that village and felt there was no other way out but clearly at this point and it's not mentioned in the writings but but clearly I think we can establish that Narvaez has lost contact with his ships and they they continue on these travels they continue heading to Ate and as they're going they're being shadowed by these natives who are continuing these attacks and they finally get a period of eight days where there is no attacks or no fighting you would think that the danger is cleared but it definitely isn't let's have a look Indians crept up unseen and fell upon our rear a boy belonging to a nobleman called a Valenada who was in the rear guard gave the alarm so he saw something was going on and alerted everyone. Avellaneda turned back to assist, and the Indians hit him with an arrow on the edge of the cuirass, piercing his neck nearly through and through so that he died on the spot. So this kid who was probably a teenager, you know, he's, he goes to alert him, and before he can even turn around, takes an arrow to the neck and dies. The casualties, I think, are being, rem remember this writing is occurring years later, so this is probably one of the more memorable casualties, but with the number of men that got wounded in the lagoon, I'd be surprised if people did not die along the way because of those injuries as well. So the group finally reaches Aute, and they find that the natives who live there have burned the entire town to the ground. But they did leave behind their fields of food. At this point, Narvaez sends a group of men, which included Cabeza de Vaca, who's the writer here, to go and find the coastline. So the men leave. They find an inlet, but discover that the inlet is so large that the coastline must still be a distance away. Cabeza de Vaca and his group return to Ate and find that the remaining men are sick and many are wounded from an Indian attack that occurred while they were away. So while they were gone, an attack occurs, men are wounded, but they're also sick. And it leads me to believe Potentially, there may have been some type of poisoning that occurred, but it's hard to tell because this group was very tired, very hungry. The illness could have occurred naturally. But, you know, that thought runs through your head as you read this. They travel together to the inlet. So the sick men and the healthy men, everybody comes together. 
and they find it difficult to move because the sick individuals are becoming sicker and there aren't enough horses to carry these infirm people. So the journey is slowing and slowing and slowing down. Then something else happens, which isn't going to help the group. Let's have a look. Most of the horsemen began to leave in secret, hoping thus to save themselves, forsaking the governor and the sick who were helpless. One third of our people were dangerously ill, getting worse hourly, and we felt sure of meeting the same fate with death as our only prospect. So things are clearly becoming grim, and we can deduce now that optimism was probably as scarce as the food by this point. And men with horses are leaving because they could travel further in less periods. So more desertion essentially is occurring, and the last desertion, if you'll recall, actually occurred early in the expedition at Santo Domingo. So they're waiting on the shoreline. They get to the shoreline, and they're waiting. There's no relief in sight. They don't know who's going to come, if anybody's going to come, where the ships are. So they decide as a group to build boats and sail off of Florida in those boats. Let's look at the reading. None of us knew how to construct ships. We had no tools, no iron, no smithery, no oakum, no pitch, no tackling. Finally, nothing that was indispensable. Neither was there anybody to instruct us in shipbuilding, and above all, there was nothing to eat while the work was going on. So they've got to now build these boats to get off of the land, and they've got to do it with no experience, no food, no nothing. So how on earth are they going to do this? Here's how they work together to get construction of these ships started. A man comes forward in the crew and says that he can make wooden flues and bellows of deer skin. Bellows, by the way, I, I looked this up, and I believe what, they, what bellows are are their bags, essentially, which work to allow you to pump air onto sails. So they were going to make bellows of deer skin so that they can fan the sails in a certain direction. Additional parts had to be, I mean, this was a, this was a total uh, uh, MacGyver job, if you will. The group made parts out of the stirrups, spurs, crossbows, and any other iron parts they could find. They fed themselves by raiding the Ate village, and every three days they killed a horse and fed that horse to the workers who were working on the boats and those individuals that were sick. So now they're to the point where obviously the horses are going to become little use to them because they're stripping them down for the parts to build these ships, and they need food, so they're going to kill a horse every three days and, and feed it to the appropriate people. They used the fiber and husks of palmettos to incorporate into the ship's construction, and they don't, uh, in the journal, they don't go into detail as to how, and there was one carpenter present out of this entire group. The work on these ships started on August 4th, and on September 20th, so about 46 days later, five ships had been completed. And I would have, I would have loved to have seen a picture of what these looked like. The description goes on to talk about how they used the tails and manes of the horses for rope. They used shirts for sails, stones for anchors, and when they killed the horses, they skinned them, and they used the horse skin for carrying water. So I want everybody to kind of stop for a minute and ask and imagine what it would have been like to be on this expedition. And that's why, I'm not sure if I said it in the last episode, but as I read this, I felt like I was reading 
uh, the 16th century version of the Odyssey. It was just all these weird things going on. But in the Odyssey, they didn't have to use the ingenuity that these men had to use. You know, they weren't eating horses and using parts to put together boats. It's interesting the means that these individuals went to in order to survive. The journal goes on to talk about how uh, the group would go into the inlet to gather seafood on occasion. And on two separate instances, a total of 10 men were killed by native attacks while heading into the inlet. And the journal actually says that they could see the attacks but not really do anything, which is a real helpless position to be in. On September 22nd, they boarded the five ships. Each ship had between 47 and 49 men, so we could deduce that there was just under 250 men remaining. During their time on shore, 40 men died of disease, and ultimately, they ended up eating all but one horse. What a lucky horse, right? That is the one horse that they end up taking on the ship. So these five ships set sail, almost 50 men in each ship. And the journal goes on to say that nobody, nobody knew how to navigate. So the expedition has started with 600 men. We're down to 250. Clearly, we could deduce that the navigator has died. There's no navigator left. They head off of the Florida coast, and because of all of this, and again, there's no mention of where they're wanting to go, but instead of going south and heading back to Cuba, they go west, and we'll cover that in more detail next time on Historical Context.